All right, so let's get started. Today we're going to conclude with the, with the chapter 3. And uh, starting from next week, we're going to start chapter 4. Uh, I guess you have, we have we're going to have one more week, which is the next week. And then we're going to have the reading week. And after that, we'll have the, the midterm week. Um, question, yeah. Is the midterm going to be on Monday or it's, it's already posted uh, in, in Moodle. It's on Wednesday. Wednesday? Yeah. Right. yeah. Guys, keep checking Moodle because I'm, I'm getting questions that are already answered in Moodle. For instance, uh, there were questions about what number are we, have, are we supposed to use with eCall, like some weeks ago. But before that, I was already posted uh, some instructions on the, the lab sections for input-output for RVS. Also, the, so always make sure you check the announcement. I've already uploaded the slides for today and previous lecture, so you can find them online. Yep. Are you going to upload some like midterm samples? Or yeah. Um, let me so let me tell you this. Uh, I've already uploaded some sample questions on chapter one and chapter two. You can find it on Moodle as well. I'll upload uh, some sample questions on chapter three as well. So these these would be equal. I mean, regarding it, the the difficulty. There are as, <laughs> yeah, the next question. I have another question. Yeah. So is there going to be any definitions or just like all of practical and like computation? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to memorize things. Yeah. You just have to know how to solve things or process certain procedures that we discussed here. Okay? Any more questions? All right. Your lab deal is also posted uh, today, so you have time to work on it. Uh, if you had questions, uh, go to your TA's office hours, and then again Monday with me. And then next week you're gonna have your lab D. Okay. So let's let's conclude with chapter three. Um, you we've already seen how how the instructions uh, arithmetic works in risk five, and then we we started floating point. Your your labs this week were about floating point as well. So I'm, I hope. Uh, we can comfortably pass uh, the latter section of chapter three, which are a couple of examples on how we're going to use a floating point in procedures. So in this case, for instance, we have a we have a floating point example on how to uh, the instruction uh, the the procedure is called FAHR, so Fahrenheit. So in this small code snippet, we're going to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. Okay, so it's it's a float. F2C, which receives float of uh, Fahrenheit, and it's going to return the conversion from Fahrenheit to, to float. 5 to 9, multiply the value of Fahrenheit minus 32, right? So, as you see here, the uh, FAHR is in float number 10, right? And the result would be in F10. So, when we let me compile this into RISC-5 so the assembly works as this. First of all, the compiler uh, places the three floating point constant in memory, right, within easy reach of uh, register X3. So these are those, so F0 and F1. The first two instructions uh, load the constant. 5 and 9, right, into floating point registers, which are F0 and F1. Then uh, they're divided to, to get the fraction at F0, okay? So uh, up until here is straightforward. So we're here now. Um, another thing about compilation flow, many of the uh, optimized compilers, when they parse this code, and they see they're not going to change these two constants, won't change. In order to save some computation at runtime, right, they already compute the value of F0 right here at compile time. So they have the value of the 5 over 9, and they embed it in the code at compilation. So when they run, when somebody runs this code, it was already pre-computed, 
So these are some of the optimizations that the compiler can do to avoid recomputing every time this program needs to run. Okay, so suppose this program was part of um, a website that was accessed two million times, I don't know, per day or per month. So this computation needed to be run every time somebody would access this, right? But if you just find a way to embed the output of these two constants in your code when it's running, right, this becomes a compilation um, operation rather than a runtime operation, okay? So these are the different things that, um, I mean, if you had a compiler course, course or later on in your grad studies, if you had a um, code optimization course, you might learn, right? So this is a job that is up to compiler to to make it as a compi uh, compile time uh, constant value or at the right time, okay? All right. So um, then after that, we're gonna load the constant 32 here and subtract it from the, the FAHR, right? F of 10. Here. And finally, we multiply the, the two intermediate and we're going to return. Okay, was that clear? No news is good news or bad news? You see in Linux when you run a command and there is no news, which is a good news? Here, I, I, don't, I don't see any questions. Is it a good news or bad news? Bad news. <laughs> so why don't you ask questions if, if, it, if it's a bad news? Is it clear? Can you trace the code first? What is it? Can you trace the code first? Yeah, yeah. That that's exactly what I did. Well, can you like write it down? Write it down. Write it down? So yeah, it's it's, it's already written. Okay, sure. So here you load the two consent, right? And then you compute it at runtime. I was talking about the, the modern compiler that can accomplish such tasks at compile time rather than runtime. So it's up to compiler to decide. Then after that, um, we're going to load the constant 32 here and subtract it from the, um, the FAHR of F10. And that was just, you just have to return the value. Nope. Can we expand the X3? Where did X3 come from? Remember first? Say it again? X3. The okay. constant 5, constant 9, constant 23, all have an X3 following by it. But why do we need the X3? Like, X3, like, what? Why do we have it? Why do we need it? It doesn't expand where the X3 comes from. No, it, 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 it was the, it was the, uh, the address it was the register that, that was used for uh, with the compiler. So the compiler places the three floating point constant in memory within is reach of register X3, right? So the compiler decided to put all of those three constants in X3. They are inside X3, but at different addresses. Okay? 32, 9, and 5. Yeah. For the J A L R. Um, where does the where does it return the value to? It is 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 part of the um, a bigger routine. Yeah, we just it just mentioned that we're returning. Yeah, perhaps there was something else. Yeah, yeah. But when we put constants, when we name the constants, it will always get an X three, right? Like we should always just put it in X three. Yeah, because in this case we on, we only needed three of those, so that when you run. Uh, when you compile this code, in this specific case, the compiler decided to put all of them in X3, but different addresses in X3, right? Um, excuse me, can you 
they're just addresses inside x3 okay so uh, so you have x3 you, you could you could uh, I don't know insert a, a whole array inside right in memory but the compiler decided in different addresses of that x3 I'm gonna assign different values that I need one of them was f0 which was 5 the other one was 9 and the other one was 32 right it just decided to put, to, to put it in, in, in a single, you know, placeholder, let's say. Think about it as x3. Yeah. Um, sir, um, do you mean R returns to x1 or it returns return to x0? Like, J, we know that it jumps to the A0, right? Right. So what is JL? Does anyone know? JL? Because like, it's, x, it's returning to x0. The default value of x0 is always the Right. So it was part of a bigger chunk of the code, so it was returning to where it was, right, before. Does anyone know the answer? Are you guys at the back? Yeah. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, it's simply a jump that can go to very far away code. Sometimes the normal JL can't go far enough because the immediate attempt isn't big enough. So we need to use a register to get that far. Was that clear? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's see a more um, complex example. You need to pay more attention in order to understand this. This is um, seems this seems easy, but it's very practical in computer science and specifically machine learning. This is one of the core kernels that many applications use. That uh, it's just a matrix multiply, right? It is known also as gem, so G E M M, and that D that I put there is just a double precision version of that gem. And GEM stands for General Matrix Multiply. Matrix, Matrix, Multiply. So we are, we are actually multiplying A and B, right? And that C is sort of an offset or, or bias we add to that. Can anyone, does anyone know what's the main application of this kernel in computer science? Have you seen a GEM kernel? It's actually the core of many machine learning algorithms, such as uh, image recognition or in neural network or in deep learning. Uh, every layer of that network mostly consists of one gem because you're trying to convolve some of the images. So there are act actually, there are some matrices, right? At the end of the day, if you zoom into that kernel, um, so it, it's been used many times. So there are millions of uh, gem versions online if you, if you Google and their optimized version and non-optimized version depending on the architecture so uh, though it sounds very easy but depending on the hardware and the application this is a very important kernel all right so let's have a look at this these matrices are all 32 by 32 so a is 32 by 32 and b is so it's as if i'm storing the value in c which is 32 by 32 this is c and that was again C plus A multiply B. So all 32. Okay. I'm multiplying this and add them with C and then storing the, the, out, the output to C. Okay. So let's see the C code. It's pretty straightforward. So uh, we need to define these I, J, and K as their iterator for the loops. Because we need three loops now, one loop to loop over i, right? i plus one is for j, so one is for i, the first 32. The other one is for the second 32, because we are multiplying in two dimension, right? So this is your matrix, these two. So it's as if you are getting the first row and then multiplying it with the first column, right? So you have you need to have two iterators, one as i, second as the j, and the third one is just 
an iterator to, to, to iterate over the results and then add it to um, C itself. Okay, so that's why CI of J is going to be equal to, again, itself plus the output of the multiplication of A, K, and B, K, I. So as a general rule for matrix multiplication, these two should be the same, right? Let me multiply this to this. That, that's the row, and this is the column, okay? The output would be, again, I and J. Then you have an output of this matrix, which is I and J, and you can multiply with another I and J matrix, so you can store it back, okay? So that's the C version. The addresses of um, CB, CAB, are in X10, 11, and 12. So these are our arrays or matrices. And those iterators that I talked about, I, J, and K, are in 5, 6, and 7. Okay? So, uh, note that the CI of J here, right, is used in the innermost loop above. Okay? Since the loop index is K, Right? This is index is k because we are iterating over k index. Um, the index does not affect i and j, okay? Because we are o looping over k, so j is irrelevant here at this point. So we can avoid loading and storing c i of j on each iteration here. This is one optimization you can apply when you generate the code. This is transparent to uh, i and j at this point. Instead, what the compiler can do is load um, c i of j, right, into a register outside the loop and accumulate the sum of the products of uh, a of i and k with b of uh, k and j. So accumulation is When you when you save the partial results, okay. All right, so let's have a look at this. In order to make some of the instructions easier, so we define an li here. So li here stands for load loads a constant into a register, right? So first we have four li's. So the, the, the procedure starts with saving the, the load termination value, right, of 32 uh, in a temporary register, okay? And then we initialize the three uh, for loop variables, okay, which are these, okay? Then we got uh, our first issue. We are trying to calculate a 2D matrix, right? But the memory is, is going one way in, in 1D. So how are we going to tackle this, right? So we need to address a matrix of 2D, which has rows and columns, right? How are we going to place them in, in memory? Can anyone suggest a workaround? So we are trying to store a 2D structure in memory. Right? Any suggestions? Can we try for, um, let's say we have a column, which is a memory, memory we got a column, and then which elements in the column we're going to load. Can we do that? For example, if we want certain positions, then we call the element in 3 row, and then 
they tell him which anime they want to call it to the, something like that. Like, yeah, I, so yeah, I got like your point. So in general, they have uh, two different conventions in, in a 2D version. Uh, they call it row major or column major, okay? It depends on which way you want to align your, uh, your store. In this case, if, if you want to make sure that the compiler understands what ex specific element during this 2D dim dimensional structure we are trying to access, right? We need to skip certain rows, right? Certain eyes, like, I don't know, Y up to I. And then we find the row that, is, that contains the value we were interested, and then we just shift that with J, right? Which was the, third, uh, the second one. So in this case, both of them are 32 by 32. So what we can do is, to calculate the address of CI of J, which is a 32 by 32, uh, we need to def know actually how a 32 by 32 structure, uh, or on an array in this case, is stored in memory, right? So the first step is, uh, we're going to skip over the uh, i's single dimensional array, or row, right? We define it by i here. And just like I mentioned, we want to reach the, to that element that we are interested. So we need to skip several rows out of that, right? Several i's. Thus, we can multiply the index in the first dimension by, by the size of the row. Right? So if we, we skip like three rows, we need to multiply three to the, to the size of the row, which is 32. Okay? Is it clear up to now? So we want to access an element in the fourth row. So we need to skip 32 by three rows before. Okay? And then we can index that fourth row using a, uh, another element. Was that clear? Right, say, say I want to access the, the, so let me just, okay, I'm here, yeah. This is the first, second, I want to access this element, okay? And this is 32 by 32. Since I'm skipping two rows, so I need to skip two 32s and then index the third one with just the, the column, okay? Say it was the fifth one. So in order to access this, I need to skip two 32, which is 64, and then inside this, the third one, which I'm going to access, I need to index it by five, okay? So this element would be 64 plus five. Is it clear now? So, so, say you want to access this element. I mean, think about, think about this as, as a 2D matrix, okay? So this is the first line, and L2 is the fourth line, okay? So that's the first column, and this is the second column. I want to access this Li here. How do I address it in a one-dimensional memory? I want to access here. It's in my fourth row, right, and second column. So I need to skip these three rows, okay? And the moment I reach the fourth row, which contains the element that I wanted, I just need to index it by this, right? It's just uh, a matrix indexing. So say this is 32, right? So I have skipped three of these 32s. The first line, the second row, and the third row. So you need to multiply 3 by 32. And then you want to add this second, which was the index of that, right? Plus 2. You're going to reach here. Is it clear? Cool. OK. So now we know how we're going to um, calculate the two-dimensional address for that, OK? So we are arriving here. Um, thus, we multiply the index by the size of the row, right? And this SLLI is actually doing this. So we're shifting it five 
Why 5? Because 5 is 2 to the raise of 5 is going to be 32. And that's the size we want to skip. Okay? The value is scoring in the S5 is 0. When you do the left shift, this will always be 0. Say that again? The value is scoring in S5 is 0. When you do the left shift, it will always equal to 0. Yeah, that's, that's, that's just the first iteration, and, and that's going to be the first one. Then, then you're going to assign it again. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in, in, in a second. Yeah, that was a good question. So now, we, we need to shift by 5, okay, which is the size of the row. Okay. And then, we have to do the indexing by J, okay, and that's the uh, and that's the add for that because we have multiplied, for instance, three rows here, and on the fourth row we didn't we don't need to multiply anymore. We just have to add the index. So that's an addition here. That's the multiplication. So we are up to here. We found what we wanted to play around with, okay. Now, for for adding the second index, so we can select the the J's element. So we need to do the same thing for the second element. Finally, uh, we are working in a byte space, right? To turn this sum into a byte index, we multiply it by the size of the the matrix element in bytes. Right? So that's why we have um, SLLI x30 uh, of 3 here. That's a byte offset. All right? Now, we need to add this sum to the base address of C because we are writing again on, on onto C itself. Okay? We start with from the base address, whatever we wanted to add, we wanna uh, we wanna write to the base address of C, giving the address of C I J, right? And then we load the double precision number uh, C I J into F of zero, which is here. Okay? Now the next five are just similar instructions, just like what we did for the first one, for the C of I and J, but this will be done for A of K and uh, J, because we wanted to do a C plus A and B, and that those fives were for C, right? These fives are for A, and in the next slide, we're going to see what was for B. Okay. Was that clear up to now? K1, X5, X6, X7, A, it can be other numbers, right? It, it, it don't always be start with zero. You can say it's 
Yeah, I mean, it, this it's is. Right? Yeah, so this this L I actually is is not a real <laughs> instruction. We call it pseudo instruction because to simplify what what's been initialized before. So it's not necessarily zero here. Yeah. So so it's given. So yeah. basically, those numbers should be whatever question you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But since it was a two dimensional and it was three matrices, it would take a long, yeah. you know, number of instructions just to initialize it. It was confusing when you say it's in for loop. Like, what do you mean by loop? It was so confusing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Where? Yeah. Because this only this only computes the byte offset for i and j. This computes the element that we are trying to access, right? No, because it's three of eight, right? We are we are we are trying to uh, access it by three by eight. Each of those bytes are eight, right? We are actually turning this sum, right, into a um, into a byte index sum, right? So we can multiply it by the size of the matrix element in bytes. So what? Why doesn't have to be true? You know, in this case, in this case, it's true. Right? Are we just storing it in bytes? So at each byte is eight, that's why we have to it? Yeah. This is just this example. It, it doesn't have to be generalized. Yeah. If you have any questions, please ask because if, if the problem is resolved right now, it's much better when you just go back home and in two days you have no idea what happened here. So just try to understand it right now. It's, it's, it's for the benefit of you and me as well. What's the point uh, behind the byte offset? Like, what does it do? Why, why do you Can anyone answer this question? What's the point of byte offset? It's so that, like, whatever the red, the, whatever the I and J is on, so that it's actually, like, readable. Because the address that it goes, uh, the memory address is 6 by 8. Yeah. Can you say that again so your friend get it? Uh, because <coughs> the addresses for the memory goes by 8. So the next, the next address would be by 8. So you just multiply it by 2 to the power of 3, which is 8, so that it could be read the memory itself. Oh, so the 3 is just to shift to the. Yeah, multiply by 8. That's the adding to the subtract as well? Sorry? Or divide and offset or divide and offset? Yeah, yeah, he's talking about the summing. Right, right. So like, yeah, three, three to the eight, um, or whatever. That's that's like the, the like going to the right. Like you multiply it by thirty-two, like a couple times, and then you added uh, eight twice to go to the right to get to that point in the matrix. Uh, I'm talking about like you're drawing in the top there, like just as a, as a reference point. The first is L I or or the second one? The second. Uh, yeah. So so the second one is actually computing the byte offset for I and J. Because three is, is like two to the raise of three is going to be eight, right? And each byte is eight. Yeah. Um, what's the name of the byte address? What's in X and X12? Why are we adding those two? What's in what register? X10 and X12. For the first one, when we're the address of yeah, so X, yeah, so X10, X11, and X12 are containing the addresses of C, A, and B, okay, here. And I and J and K are in X5, X6, and X7, okay.
Questions? Why is CAD a register of X? CAD, what line? Here, slide. This slide? Yeah, the bottom. It's just yeah, yeah. It's an assignment. Yeah, just we assign it. You could just shuffle the assignment. Like you could have assigned C to 12. Right. Yeah, but in this is example, we assign it here. Okay. All right. So this is we how we access. Um, a 2D address with a 1D, right? <coughs> this is how we treat the sum, turn the sum into a, a byte index by 3, which is 8, right? 2 to the raise of 3 is 8. And then uh, by, in, by here, we have the C of i and j in F, uh, F0. The next five are similar instructions just like those five, but instead for A, right, which are K and J, just like that, we need to compute the 1D out of that 2D matrix, then the offset, and then we add, okay? So since we already processed C and A, again, we have to have another five for B, here, this 5, right, again, this was 32, and that was the size of the row, plus K, that we need to access, so it's like, we skip some rows, and then we access some with the index, okay, and then, these two are actually the ones that do the addition and multiplication, right, Before that, we just needed to align it. In the, they call this alignment of matrices, which spends most of the time when you are doing it in parallel or um, do other optimizations. The tricky part is just aligning what you want to compute, what you want to add, and what you want to multiply. Right. So after the multiply and add, you have the results here in F0. Then... Um, what you want to do is the final block increments the, the index k and loops back if the index is not 32. Um, if it is, if it's 32, that, that's the end, right? And then we need to store this time accumulated in F0 into C, I, and J. Okay. So these these final instructions are actually uh, increment the index for us. So remember we had one inner loop, innermost loop, right? We had one middle one and one outermost loop. So the final instructions are actually incrementing the index variable of these three loops and go back if the if it was not still 32 okay You got why, why we did this? It's just an initialization. Yeah. 
You still don't like the other half. Okay. So uh, there are some small issues left uh, that, that we're going to talk about in, in, uh, in this chapter for floating point. First is the, the issue with rounding, right? Although you might just have a small difference between, say, you computed something and it was like 26667. And then you round it to, I don't know, 268 here. Although this is very small difference, but say if you, if you wanted to access this in a loop for a million times and you wanted to start computing other stuff using this, right? Square, cubic form, and the problem propagated and it would just, at the end of the day, you, you would have perhaps a huge offset between these two points. So how are we going to address this? In, in the standardization of IEEE for the floating points, they have uh, envisioned some extra bits for precision, so guard, round, and sticky. So we're going to have uh, an example about rounding, right, for the bits. Okay? So for instance, suppose you want to add these two, 256 of the base 10, multiply 10 to 234 of 10, multiply 10 to the raise of 2, assuming that we have three significant decimal digits, okay? Say, let's, let's have this um, uh, multiplication with guard and round digits. So, what we're going to round is, if any number was from 0 to 49, we're going to round it down, it's less than half. The half itself is a tiebreaker, so you can go either way, depends on the, the convention. And the ones above half, you're going to round it up. Okay? So after computing this, you're going to have 2.3656. So 56 is above. So the final value becomes 237 10 to the raise of 2. Okay? Because we have two round digits here. So we're going to have arrived to the final value as, as 237. So this happened because we had guard and round digits here. What if we didn't have? So we wanted to compute the same thing. If not, you see, we would arrive without the guard and round digit. The final value would be 236 instead of 237, right? And that was just a small example. So suppose you were, you were to use that 237 in a million other different loops, right? So you will have different results at the end. You see what the issue is? Question? Depending on the convention, yeah. You, you might just go up and down, or sometimes you just have another bit. Uh, they call it a sticky bit sometimes. So if you set that one up, you might round up or down. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to skip this stuff, uh, but just stop one here, just to let you know that the one that you saw for the gem, it was an unoptimized version, right? Just like this in a, in a, in an, in a C code. So this is a double uh, precision gem. Right? In, in modern computers, like your laptop, that supports x86 instructions, your AMD and your Intel CPUs, um, there are other instructions that are called within the umbrella of AVX, or Advanced Vector uh, Extension, right? It was introduced in late 2008 or 9 by Intel. So many of the applications, they can use 
those specific uh, AVX instructions, depending on the version their CPU supports. And uh, instead of defining your gem this way, just some loops, and then add and accumulate, right? Which produces this, uh, this bunch of x86 instructions. There are other AVX specific instructions, they call this SSE in Intel machines. And we have, if you check your laptop, uh, in its instruction, it's written up to what SSD it supports, like SSD 2, 3, and 4. We have even 4.2 now. So these specific instructions that are not like C, but they are not like assembly itself, they are, they are called intrinsic, intrinsic C. Okay. So by using these specific instructions, you're going to let compiler know that you're doing a specific vector instructions depending on the hardware that you're running that code, for instance, your laptop or, or a server. And it's going to generate an optimized code depending on the way you use those intrinsic. For instance, here, that underscore MM256 is going to uh, tell the compiler that the, the, the variable holds 464 double precision 14 point values, right? And it's going to and it's enabling it to, to make it in parallel. So when you generate the final assembly, instead of the previous assembly, you're gonna have these four copies of that, right? So this is one way to speed up the computer, okay? If you wanna see what uh, instructions <coughs> your CPU uh, supports, you can just check uh, in Linux, it's, it's very easy. Let me just... If I can put it here, so say you're in a Linux machine. Right. By using uh, uh, proc CPU info, you can get the info of your CPU, and it's going to show you how many processor uh, processors it has, starting from zero. So in this machine, it has like four cores, so zero to three, and the the architecture is is a Xeon CPU that has the name Sandy Bridge, so that's the name of that architecture, and these flags. So shows what kind of intrinsic it supports, right? If we if we process this line, you see that that specific CPU supports MX instructions. Some of the intrinsic it supports SSE four one four underscore one and four underscore two. So that means that you can use those intrinsics that I show you in your code uh, and the compiler that you know runs this code and this architecture understand that. This supports this hardware supports that specific instructions, right? So you can speed up some of your programs using this. Oh. These are hardware features that your processor supports. So when you buy a CPU online, an, an Intel CPU, it's not just i7 or i9. It, it has a specific number, right? That i7 or i9 only shows the the classes of the hardware, right? If it's supporting Sandy Bridge or the previous generation. But the actual thing, except the the frequency that the CPU supports, is those hardware features that you can use, right? So for instance, this CPU supports instructions to be run on SSE uh, version 4 underscore 1 and 4.2, which is like almost uh, latest. We have better Right? Yeah. What does it mean by siblings? Um, actually, I have no idea right now. I can double check it for you. Okay. Or perhaps because it's, it's only one chip, it doesn't have multi chips. Yeah, I can look it up. All right, any more questions? So, next time you want to buy a CPU, you can just check what kind of instructions it supports. Okay?
All right. I guess we are almost done. So the, the rest are just concluding remarks. I'll, I'll make sure I, I post some sample questions for chapter three so you get a sense of the some samples that you might see in midterm. So, and, and you already had chapter one and chapter two. So you can start, you know, starting for your midterm, right? Which is in two weeks. Any questions? Yeah. See you next week. <laughs>